The Providence Journal invited eight public officials to discuss race in Rhode Island, our series about the state's changing population, the gaps that are developed among the races, and the consequences for all of us. Their comments will help shape public policy and set the climate for how we treat each other. Well, thank you very much for participating. Uh, we published a series of stories this year called Race in Rhode Island. And our findings include that the state's population is changing dramatically. We've seen a number of gaps develop among the races in all kinds of areas, education, health care, income, home ownership. And there's been consequences for all of us because of that. So we thought this was the appropriate time of the project to bring in eight public policy makers to stress your views on what our findings have been. So uh, let me just start with the, the first question. Um, what have you learned from the series? Has anything surprised you at all? It hasn't surprised me. However, what it has done is uh, create a discussion um, based upon facts and statistics, which oftentimes uh, I find is anecdotal. And there are a lot of assumptions that folks, despite their point of view, perhaps, uh, whether you're look what side of the issue you're looking at, make but not often backed by statistics. So I think that perhaps has been the greatest benefit of an article like this in that it actually puts the numbers and statistics with the arguments in the discussion. So you can say, yes, that's true. It's not just a perception on the criminal justice issues. Or yes, that's true. It's not just a perception on the housing issues. Good. Kay, do you have a question? Absolutely. What are you hearing from your members about the issues in the series, and are they interested in introducing certain legislation to address some of the inequities we've been hearing about? Well, certainly education has been the Senate priority um, from early last year, if not before then, but certainly last year. And many of the policies which we have the Senate have embraced, such as all-day kindergarten, are in fact geared towards uh, recognizing the economic disparities that exist in our uh, public schools in particular and how important it is that all children have the op same opportunities when they attend school. Uh, that is one of I mean, a couple of the different speakers or mentions or articles have talked about this as a socioeconomic issue. And I think that's very true. And it's important that we as policymakers in the Senate really look at these issues in that way. And we can do that through our work um, in the education system. I would also say it has a lot to do, for me, uh, in the criminal justice system. I've been involved since uh, 2008, to be honest, with the Council of State Government and working uh, towards addressing many of the issues that exist within our criminal justice system. And we've made a lot of changes that have been recognized nationally on that level. But there's a lot more to do. And to be honest, it's really exciting to see the judiciary come forward, to see the law school come forward, um, and other members of the General Assembly to talk about some of the issues uh, which traditionally people say, oh, I can't talk about that. I won't sound tough on crime, which is oftentimes a political reaction to some of the issues that we discuss. And sometimes things we do make such a big difference. It wasn't last year, it was the year before we did, um, we passed the ban the box legislation. And that's been demonstrated uh, to make a significant difference uh, around the country in terms of hiring of minorities and directly ties to uh, the incarceration rates, which we have, the arrest rates that are disproportionate uh, for minority. So would you consider um, race relations or improving race relations among the priorities for the coming year? It, for A priority for me throughout my career, to be honest, has been the socioeconomic issues and affordable housing, equal access to quality health care, improving public education uh, remain and continue to be a priority. Um, we were the first state in the country to pass uh, the racial profiling bill in 2004. The Senate has, uh, was the first chamber to pass the Comprehensive uh, Act for Racing. The Senate also went back and settled a redistricting suit when you know, I very first became major majority leader. That was my one goal, working together with leaders from the community such as Harold Mess, Senator Pichardo, Charles Walton. Uh, to address the redistricting issue, to say 
no, it's not okay to wait 10 years to have two minority districts. Um, the time is now. Uh, so I would say yes, it, it has been a priority and it continues to be a priority for both me personally as a leader and for the Rhode Island Senate. I don't think I've heard specifically legislation that might be coming up in the next session. I'm oh, I'm a lot sorry. Of history, so I'm sorry. I would say that uh, there's a number of issues. Uh, certainly prioritizing, continuing our work in the area of education is a priority and looking at the school funding uh, formula as I believe education is the great equalizer and it is important. We're working with the council state governments and I anticipate there will be some legislation forthcoming from that. Another issue which I don't think is legislative but caught my attention was actually mentioned in one of the interviews that you did um, is the idea of universal uh, PSATs and SATs for all students. And I really love that idea. When I went to Cumberland, they were already doing it where they had negotiated with the testing company so all students had access to the PSAT and they didn't have to worry about the cost or making sure that the student got home and told the parent the day the test were that all of our students had it. And what it also does is it helps because the students are all working together to prepare for those tests. So I don't know if I would call it legislative, but it's something that I started talking about at the end of last session that I think would be great if we could include in the budget this year. How can we fund um, the PSATs for all students? And did that mean that they took the tests during the school day? They were right they, there? They, they had it the, into incorporated into the school day. Okay. And it really makes a huge difference. And sure. one of the interviewees had actually mentioned that. And I, when I saw it, I was like, that's exactly what we were talking about. So I think that's a really important um, step we can take. Very good. So um, we were joking the other day about you making news, so I thought I'd give you a chance to make some. We have uh, all this land trust money through bonding, as mm -hmm. you know. We've been doing this for 20 plus years, millions. And the vast majority of that money goes to seven or eight rural towns, little Compton, Long mm -hmm. Island, Champion. 80% of us live in urban areas and we get very little state money for recreation. City of Providence, five swimming pools, disaster, closed, poorest neighborhoods. City needs $500,000. Why it make some sense to adjust those bonding opportunities and spend 20% on the urban environment? I absolutely support that. I have to say, Representative Paul Crowley, I think, was the first one to include any urban Correct. open space amount. amount into a bond because in Newport it was an issue. And while it's really nice, as some might say, to buy the open space in Grass and Exeter, it would be nice to be able to improve our playgrounds and our urban open spaces. Uh, just this week, Saturday, I was at a meeting uh, with Representative Abney about bike paths. And we were talking about Pell School, and I was pointing out that the bikes path goes from north to south, but I wanted to make sure that when they were looking at this, they'd also make sure there were connectors for children who are riding their bikes to school. Uh, I think also just things like bike paths, making sure that they're not just on the outside, that they're practical so that children can ride their bikes to school when they miss the bus or the walking school bus or the bus, or and many of the children, in, Newport, we only have one school, and it was a huge issue. Joey the Gaines, who is the chairwoman of our school committee and a real leader, fought hard to close three neighborhood schools and lost her chairmanship over to consolidate into one school, which is in the north end of Newport. Uh, the result of that decision is that many, many of our children walk to school, similar to Providence. Many of the children who attend the traditional public schools are walking to school right in the city. And so I absolutely support the idea of greater investment in urban areas, in playgrounds, in bicycle paths, in swimming pools, and whatever the particular community designates as their priority. Okay. 
I just want to check that though. So is that a commitment that the next time there's a bond issue, there's going to be a certain amount of percentage of money committed to urban areas? I have absolutely, I'm very comfortable with that commitment. Absolutely. What's the percentage? I've always believed. What's the percentage? I would want to take a look and sit down with the communities and see what makes sense. I yeah. think we could do that probably with the League of Cities and Towns. Um, but certainly Providence, Woonsocket, uh, Newport, Cranston, Warwick, we all have needs. Central Falls. The Central Falls, that we all have urban needs, uh, playgrounds that are our urban open space. And uh, it's just extraordinarily important. Who's next? Kate, you want to keep going? Data from the Rhode Island Department of Education shows that public schools here are sharply segregated by race. And we want to know. Does that matter to you? If so, what should be done about it? How do we change that? I think that uh, there, the, the segregation, one of the things that Providence does right is a lottery for all children for charter schools. And many of the cities and towns don't do that. It's simply whoever goes and signs up. So I think that, um, once again, I want to be careful because I believe Providence is the one community that all students have the opportunity to participate in lottery. Uh, I think overall making our public schools better uh, is our commitment and our obligation. And we can do that with newer school facilities. I just mentioned uh, Newport. Lifting the school moratorium was not just simply lifting a moratorium. What also was done is that there is going to be an assessment of where the condition of our schoolhouses are around the state. So it's not just the politically vocal neighborhood whose school gets fixed up, repaired, and redone. Rather, there's an assessment according to need to determine which schools, physical structures, need to be repaired, torn down, rebuilt, wired for technology. Um, because the infrastructure is a huge factor in attracting a diverse population to attend a school. If you have a beautiful school, we've seen it right in Newport, we have beautiful Pell School in the North End, our population goes up because people see a beautiful physical facility. And I really believe the step we took last year requiring the inventory to assess what the needs are of the schoolhouses around the state is at least a first step in reaching that direction. I also think advanced placement courses, um, advanced placement and opportunities for our students is very important. We um, have done some work in the minority community around expanding advanced placement opportunities. I think we need to do that in all for all of our school children as well. How do you do that, with funding in the budget? Funding. Do you have a specific amount you would put toward it? Once again, I believe we're going to be looking at the school formula, and it's just an issue that oftentimes uh, falls to the wayside because of the federal requirements. Too often we're working towards a minimum in our public schools rather than the best. Before I get to your question, I've heard school funding fund revisited several times here today. I'm still not sure exactly what you're revisiting. Why the are you revisiting? Has what, 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 what's the goal here? What, what, what's the problem? Why, why are you revisiting? Um, with the development of the charter schools, what yes. has happened is we have a funding formula that isn't adequately funding traditional education. Um, we want to maintain, uh, we're, nobody's saying charter schools aren't good, mm -hmm. but what we have found is that there's a disproportionate pull from traditional public schools because we're doing it on a per student mm -hmm. basis and that means, for example, school transportation, special needs, and those categories are not are being taken from the traditional public school. For example, so, so in the city so of Providence, that's millions of dollars. I think it will require new money to education. New um, money? A, a new additional money. Let me be clear. One of the reasons we've urged the governor, uh, the folks that have been involved with this in my chamber, to look at this in the fall is it would probably require as much as 10 million new dollars to address um, the disparities that have been created oh, by, at the, in the current formula. It it's, was bound to happen. The formula's been in place for a number of years now. And the only way you can see, it doesn't mean anything bad. What it means is over time, we see where the weaknesses are. Yeah. And I think we do need additional funding. $10 million statewide? At a, I think that's at a minimum what we would at need. A minimum. What does the governor say to that? 
I think she's going to put together a work group to take a look at it. And I've talked to the mayor. I know he has said that he really feels he needs additional money for tradition for uh, funding education in the city. Uh, so I, I think we all have to work together and make education funding a priority. Yeah. Good. You want to follow that on? Well, it sort of dovetails in the question, which is, was how do you how do you manage to do that without hurting students of color who are who are you know, sort of predominantly ones in these charter schools? And you've got you know half of all charter school students in the state are Latino, so you know, that's exactly why right. you can't do it without additional money. Okay. It will require additional funding, and it's very important that be the discussion. Sure. Um, we were looking here at the 17-page school to prison pipeline in black and white, the ACLU report, and it says black, blacks are disproportionately suspended from school, stopped and searched by police, and incarcerated in Rhode Island. What legislation do you support to address those findings? Once again, I don't know if all solutions are legislative per se, but what I will say, um, on the school suspensions uh, throughout the country as well as in Rhode Island, We've seen that disabled students, uh, children with English as a second language, as well as uh, all children of color are disproportionately suspended from school. Um, different states and different cities around the country have taken a different approach to this. Uh, certainly, there is no doubt in my mind that time out of school leads to a less likelihood to succeed in school. And that suspension should be the very last alternative, particularly out of school suspensions. Uh, different uh, states have looked at, um, some cities have looked at uh, methods such as uh, what you suspend, what you impose an out of school suspension for. I would need to take a closer look at the reasons for the suspension and ensure that principals have. Uh, discretion when it comes with regard to suspension, that in-house suspensions are encouraged, and the grounds for suspension uh, are clearly demarcated, particularly out-of-school suspensions. Once again, I want to be clear about that. And this is an issue that, I have to be honest, my greatest familiarity comes from looking at the disabled community as well, where it is also a very significant issue for our students um, with disabilities. And so with an in-school suspension, is learning still going on then? Learning's Are they put in one room for a study hall? or it, they can, it can work differently in different schools, but in general, the, the, the concept is that they're still in school. <laughs> yeah, sure. So um, how often, if at all, do you, you and your Senate colleagues talk about the Black Lives Matter movement or race relations? General. Is it something that comes up regularly, or is it something that never come only comes up maybe when there's an incident on NBC or CNN that day? I think in terms of the socioeconomic disparities in our in my chamber, folks are very much aware. Um, of course, in light of what's been happening nationally. Uh, we are talking about these issues more, and rightfully so. Uh, however, what it has, what I will say is Senator Matz and Senator Pichardo in particular uh, are great leaders, and uh, they are forever mindful on many of these issues. Gail Golden, who is my ACLU champion in the chamber, is forever mindful. Senator Miller, forever mindful. Um, as some of these criminal pieces of legislation come before us, which are often very difficult for us to vote on, because inevitably it's after some horrific crime has happened, and to be able to take a step back and look at the potential unintended consequences uh, that our reaction, that a uh, legislative reaction could have, do you think is just where like those folks come into play. And they really do remind us. They, they're not afraid to stand up and say, if you do this, this is just going to have this result. Do you think it's just by luck that we haven't had a Ferguson or a Baltimore here? 
No, I've worked very closely with the law enforcement community in our state, and I think that uh, there is tremendous uh, efforts going on between our law and discussions between our law enforcement community and the leaders in the minority community. Sitting at the lunch I was at the other day to celebrate uh, the passage of the Community Policing Act. You could just see it. It was very much, everybody talked about how they didn't always agree, how they walked out of the room, um, but they're talking. And I think that's the important part. They're talking to each other, they're listening to each other, and you can hear the conversations happening. Um, so yes, it's, I, I don't think it's an accident at all. I don't think um, things like that, I don't think things like this happen by accident. You've got uh, Colonel Prowns, please, our, our local police, chiefs and uh, certainly uh, Colonel O'Donnell at the state police who are all being very uh, sensitive to what's going on around the country and reaching out to leaders in the community and leaders of the community reaching out to them as well. So, so I, I, I've been, uh, for, been on the parole board almost two years thanks to you and thanks to the Senate. Um, and what I see is drug addiction alcoholism, uh, some mental health problems, and then lack of resources to address it when they do get out. Either they flatten their sentence, I love that word, flatten their sentence, or uh, they're paroled or whatever it is. So the Attorney General has $60 million in Google money. You had that discussion with him about that Google money. And he's, he's setting on it. And First, I keep wondering why the General Assembly doesn't scoop it, but uh, they're fine on that. Uh, so Harold Metz and others want him to spend some of it on drug re Whatever he wants to spend, it's his, but he's spending zero. I would certainly encourage an expenditure of some of that money on those types of programs. I absolutely believe housing, health care, after somebody is released from prison, treatment while they're in prison and after prison for both mental health and substance abuse issues, be it drugs or alcohol, is critical to uh, avoiding reincarceration uh, and a valid expenditure. I have been engaged with some of the discussions with Senator Metz um, with our ideas for expending the Google money. The Attorney General I have reached out to, I think, uh, at least once with Senator Metz um, on these issues. He has indicated, and I take him at his word, that it requires a lot of federal sign-off as to what they can use those funds for. I've never researched that um, particular aspect of exactly what is required for the expenditure of Google money. But certainly, if there is an opening to uh, reduce recidivism, uh, then the uh, investment in housing, in treatment, and health care for both during and after uh, incarceration are critical. So did you just say, I think, I would you'd be, be willing to talk to him again? Certainly. I have. I, I believe, I don't, I, I know I've mentioned to him at least once that Senator Metz was going to be speaking to him. I think at one point Senator Metz actually had a Senate oh, yeah. resolution yeah. <laughs> that we uh, sent over to him yeah. um, that, that supported these. So I believe I'm on record already publicly believing, you know, and while I understand there may be obstacles federally, yeah. I certainly have, uh, I really believe that if we invest in treatment, and once again, assist with the housing piece of it and the employment piece of it, that recidivism will decrease. And since I know in this day and age we always make an economic argument, um, <laughs> it will cost us less. <laughs> so while it will require an initial investment, it, in the long run, I absolutely believe it saves us money. So from your position of power, can we expect you to take more of a leadership role on this and push the issue, get to the AG? If, the, if once again, the federal guidelines allow him to, I will absolutely continue to support working with Senator Metz to urge him to spend those funds on those issues. I believe in them. Okay. 
so it, it's obvious from the, the studies that uh, we did for the race balance series that many of the institutions are underrepresented. Uh, Rhode Island judiciary is dominated by pretty much white men, <laughs> although not exclusive. How do you change that from, from your position? What you do, and I've had a number of conversations with um, Maddie Lopes and others from the community and Harold Metz, obviously, about this issue. The, you have to encourage people to apply. Uh, an affirmative action of sorts, and I don't mean a formal program, but an actual reaching out uh, for qualified individuals to apply. Because there is a portion of the, comp of the population, both in minority status, woman status, and uh, that, that don't apply because they don't think they're going to get it. So, and I, get, I understand that. And I've certainly done that with women, reached out and said, go ahead, apply, apply, apply. I also did it with the minority group. At one point, somebody had come through who had not made it somewhere, and Senator Metz came to me for some guidance. And I'll be honest, that's how we ended up with Walter Stone on the bench, because I said to Senator Metz, you need to go out and get people to apply. And good, qualified, respected attorneys, you need to get them to send in their application. If they send it in, I know that they'll do it. Well, don't you know, I, next thing I knew, Senator Metz was in my office. Walter Stone applied. <laughs> so I think it's that. It's the reach out. And Thurgood Marshall Association is really trying to do that. Reach out to the community, to the law school, and encourage minority applicants. But, but in, but in Rhode Island, uh, the reason people don't apply in Rhode Island is because the assumption is it's going to come from within the political power structure of Rhode Island, which is predominantly white. And it's going to come from uh, from among the insiders, quote unquote. It's it's one of the criticisms of uh, the Richard Leach appointment. Would you turn down a, a, ju a judicial nomination if in favor of a qualified uh, candidate of color? I, I, no, because that's ultimately the governor's selection. But what I would do is encourage more minorities to apply. I don't know that it, the ultimate background checks in the selection process um, is something that is where the weakness is, that we're not getting enough people of color to apply. We're just not getting them in. I, so, I mean, I wouldn't do that for a woman. I wouldn't do it for a minority. I, I think the way the system, would I encourage the governor to select a minority, or, or as I have in women in the past, or make sure that our bench is diversified? Absolutely, I believe in that. I, and I, I have, and I will continue to do so. And once again, I've ensured in my own ability to appoint to the Board of Elections. I made sure that Bill, I, you know, I appointed Bill Weston as my appointment. Um, when Governor Chafee asked for names for the Board of Education, I recommended Joey the Gaines. I think I take very seriously my responsibility to encourage minority appointments throughout government and to advocate for those appointments, and I'll continue to do so. Um, but I, I honestly believe that there are qualified individuals that we need to just reach out. And once again, I think the Thurgood Marshall Association is kind of a structure that's in place and encourage folks to apply. And I have confidence that the governor recognizes the issue and that she'll be looking to begin to change the makeup of the bench. So there are two uh, African-American applicants, both extraordinarily well qualified in this batch. And I'm hopeful because there are, aren't there about nine vacancies between now and That's what I'm thinking. There are a yes. lot of vacancies. And I have to believe that we will see some well-qualified applicants come through the process. And if it could be well-qualified a minority and a woman, that's even better. Let me, let me, <laughs> let me just stop there for a minute because that sounds all great. But my guess is somebody had the same conversation 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and nothing changed, right? I disagree. You disagree? What, why? Yeah. I, I, because I think that it, we've tried, but it's, I, I mean, I know that in my time there, we have tried to encourage folks to apply. Let me say that. Mm -hmm. 
there has been a real problem, and it took real activism on the part of, the, my understanding is it took a real activism on the part of the community to get folks to apply. Mm -hmm. It really did. Okay. And what time frame are we thinking it changed? It sounds like you think there are more applications coming. I think right now, I think we're in the middle of the change. I, for the past six months to a year, I've been year. approached by any number of leaders in the community. And once again, I did have this conversation when we did another, um, right before Walter's appointment, some of the folks came up um, to my office and we really worked hard together right. to get people to apply. Let me ask you on a related area. Are we done with that? Sure. Yeah. So I, I went to the right big dinner last night. I know you spoke and I enjoyed it. But I looked at the audience. I don't think I saw a person of color there. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. What do you think of that? that those are barriers that haven't been broken. Um, I will say that um, the governor's, um, you know, economic advisory board, we're going to have appointments, and that's something I'm being very sensitive to. Um, the governor's what? The Economic Policy Council that oh, she's yeah, putting yeah, yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, I have several names that my staff has reached out to, and right. I'm going to look at them and make my appointment, make sure my appointment is right. either is a member of the minority community. Yeah. Um, it's true, the RIPEC dinner in particular, I was joking with uh, another woman. When I first started going years ago, to be honest, it was all suits. Um, all men. All, all men. Um, so we've gotten a few more women there, right. and now, um, yes, we, we need to do more to reach out. Um, we need to see more minority businesses. And once again, these are, RIPEC tends to be the very large corporations. Right. So it doesn't make sense to me why there aren't more folks yeah, the, there. Ch the chamber didn't won't, much, won't look much different in two or three weeks. No. So, I'm going to try to get to the why. Why is that? Uh, you know, we have a, a minority community. We do have uh, people of color starting businesses. Why aren't they part of the major business organizations of the state that are for networking, doing business, making money, commerce, what you're talking about, the economy, make a Trump? Why doesn't that happen? And the only thing I can say is it requires an affirmative act on the behalf of the RIPEX to say to Amit Gal, who's the chair, yeah. why don't you bring somebody from your staff? Because a lot of these companies have diversity within themselves. Yeah. Hasbro, uh, Bank, of Bank of America, they have diversity yeah. within themselves. So really, it's almost an issue to say to them, next RIPEX dinner, when you buy that table, yeah. Uh, maybe you could bring somebody, one of your department heads, somebody that... Um, so, uh, Madam President, I, I think whoever gets to the table first uh, likes to keep control of it. And I, I think that's what you see every place, mm -hmm. on, on, on university boards, on the RISD Museum board, on right, all of these things. And almost always white men get there first. And you'd have to find a way to make people share. I mean, I'm not trying to answer the question for you. I'm just saying what I see. Now, I'm a member of the chamber, and yeah. you know, they're not all that inviting. Yeah. I, I don't have any, I go once every other year <laughs> to something. Yeah. But they, you know, there are 50 people that they could invite, and they don't. They yeah. just don't. And, and that's important. Following on that, the General Assembly doesn't really reflect the demographics of our state either. What efforts have you made to recruit candidates of color for the Senate, for elected office in your hometown? Talk to us a little bit about how you how do you change, here we are talking about RIPEC, how do we change the Senate? I called Marvin Abney and asked him to run. <laughs> <laughs> he was shocked. <laughs> yep, yep, I, I, I guess I'll use my own backyard as my example. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I have you know, when the opportunity of an open seat has presented itself, I work very closely, once again, on the redistricting issue. Uh, that, well, that was a federal lawsuit. Worked very hard to get Senator Metz and Pichardo elected. Uh, so I think my commitment history is clear. And then do you go to the other members as well and say, all right, when an open seat opens up, is it incumbent upon you to get to the next one to encourage everybody doing this? You know, it's really, particularly in Providence, it's a dynamic that's changing right now because so many of the districts are right at that borderline of being almost minority districts and not quite minority districts. I think it will be something which I know is not necessarily the best answer, but as the minority population grows, we are going to see more minorities holding office. It has to happen. It, it would be a shock to me 
if it didn't. I think by virtue of incumbency, mm -hmm. some of the seats that are now occupied are occupied by non-minorities. But let me just say this, as crazy as it might sound, um, those particular senators, in my experience, are so in tune with the minority community that they couldn't ask for a better advocate because I think Ray would tell you they're very conscious of the fact that their districts are changing is the way we would say it in the General Assembly and that the makeup of those districts are changing and they want to address the needs of the community they represent. So as long as they're on their toes and doing those kind of things, sometimes it's campaigning materials and newsletters and bilingual. It, it can be events at a different type of location than you might traditionally have your location. Being more inviting, getting out at community events, uh, those are the kind of things uh, that make a difference. Can I talk about breast cancer? And I just use that uh, because, as you know, breast cancer, you catch it in stage one, you live, you catch it in two, you probably live three, and four, forget it as a rule. I pick that because we have health disparities with the minority community in every arena. Cancer, heart, stroke, everything. And even, I learned the other day, first time blindness. And so the state's supposed to do something as minority program, which I'm now opposed to, because it's so small. And you send people over there to something that's so small, and that's where they're supposed to go. And anyway, that's my question to you. I, can we have a refocus? I, I was hoping, I told the governor a couple months ago, when we get done fixing the incarceration problem, which you'll fix in the next year, yeah. could we look at health disparity? It, it's deadly. I think that it, it is worth very much important that we look at it. And I think we have a unique moment in time with the Affordable Health Care Act uh, to work on what some folks have referred to as health literacy. Um, very much like financial literacy. It's great to give everybody a health insurance card, mm -hmm. but a lot of uh, our lower socioeconomic population isn't using that card the way they should or could and what's available to them. I also have great optimism in this particular area in the new Director of Health, um, who has a particular focus on public health, uh, that we will be able to work with her to address some of these issues. But one thing I believe which crosses minority lines, it's really a socioeconomic issue, Senator Palm has been really out in front on, is this concept of health literacy. And it is the idea that it's great to give everybody insurance, so now do they just go to the emergency room and give their insurance card, or are we getting folks to the doctor and to, on a regular basis for early screening? Which they don't and know how to do. Which they don't know how to do. Uh, so I think it's an issue, once again, that's a socioeconomic issue, and we have a, a really unique opportunity right now with the Affordable Health Care Act to get out there and uh, do some education. And so if I could do a quick follow-up. So uh, both Yale for New Haven and Harvard for Cambridge and Boston uh, is going into the community, spending money, doing real community health. Mm -hmm. Our community health, it's not even ours, <laughs> Brown University's community health does 2%. Oh, and I'm not talking dollar-wise, I'm talking about because their capacity is less. So I keep looking at, we can't get a perfect storm. The state, and I'm being critical, the state's not doing what it could do. And then our major health school is doing almost nothing. Spends not a single dime on community. In fact, what it does is take federal money and does studies. I, I hate to be so critical because no, I'm all no. around. And, and I, and I will say Providence may be a little different than some communities, but I do want to say our CAP agencies, um, our health centers are doing a pretty good job of reaching out and providing quality health care in some, like in Woonsocket and in Newport, uh, they are reaching out. In terms of uh, the hospital lifespan in particular, or Care New England, um, I don't know what initiatives they have, or Brown for that matter. I do know that as part of the budget this year, we included some fundings for what we call the diversion program 
to catch people at the emergency room um, and divert them to uh, before they get admitted or just simply treated to other types of care, whether it be for mental health center, the Providence Center is going to play a critical role in the diversion program, and Senator Miller's been a leader. But it's taken us almost three years to get that program up and running. We've been working with the hospitals, with the mental health centers, just to get that program up and running, which will, once again, save us money in the long run mm -hmm. if we can uh, divert people from the emergency room. So what makes that a priority? So I'm hearing the discussion here about the health inequities and how you solve that. It's often <coughs> solvable. Is it a money issue? Is it a focus issue? Is it everybody you know, saying the same thing every day? You, you form public policy now for years. What makes that happen? I think one of the things that we've tried to do in the Senate, and it's been changing not just in Rhode Island but nationally, is the recognition of mental health and substance abuse issues as health issues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've passed some parity bills the past year. We've seen the pass at the national level. There really was historically not a will, a public will, or a political will, nobody was asking about nobody, to really address substance abuse and mental health issues as a health issue. We're doing that now, and it's long in the coming, but it's been a reality, not just in Rhode Island, but I believe across the country. One of the things that we notice as we work on a series like this is that not everybody's talking about the issues out loud and publicly. Just the other night at RIPEC, you spoke for some minutes, and your only mention of racial disparities was hinting at them when you talked about the full day kindergarten and the need for that to close mm -hmm. the achievement gaps. Why not talk more about the racial divides in the state? It's a fair question, probably because they make people uncomfortable. Um, you know, that it's uh, always engenders a discussion, and it's a uh, very fine line between promoting dis divisiveness and promoting an awareness. And as elected officials, we often choose our words very carefully, as you say, and maybe hint rather than say directly. And that's perhaps the most honest answer I can give you. Um, that that's, it's just not easy all the time to talk about these kind of issues um, in terms of race and in terms of uh, the realities of the disparities that confront us. And once again, what I, where I started in saying that some of this factual information makes it easier to talk with, talk about. Historically, I have found the more facts that I'm armed with when I go into these discussions, particularly in the area of immigration, um, it, the better off I am. If I have some facts mm -hmm. that I can bring to the table, um, I can dispel that 50 million people are getting right here, you know, or that whatever, that it's costing, you know, it's, it's the sole reason for the economic downturn of the state and the world's going to end. If I have those facts, I can work with those facts. So, well, so we also talked about how non-diverse the audience was last night. Had the audience been diverse, would you have talked about the issues more? Were you gauging what you would say, knowing the crowd that comes to a right back dinner? Let me say this. I always say I always make the comment when I think think out loud about this. It's, I'm probably a lot more comfortable giving a speech at Kids Count than I am at RIPAC. But <laughs> am I a lot more direct at Kids Count in terms of talking about the issues that we're discussing here today? Sure. I talked about child care subsidies last night. I talked about the fact that we can't expect uh, people to get into job training programs right. with no daycare. It took a pilot program and then an extension this year, working together with the administration yeah. to provide childcare vouchers yeah. for people going to work, going to job training, because they weren't eligible for job care vouchers, uh, for daycare vouchers, until they started the job. So, I mean, it sounds like a real common sense thing, but it was something we had to fight for in a pilot program and a budget. So oftentimes issues of race and issues of disparity are issues of access. And so whether it's access to education, whether it's access to job training, whether it's access to health care, you have to look at whether or not people have access, whether it's access to the RIPEC dinner, to network and make a connection so that mm -hmm. next mm -hmm. business. I think that it sometimes requires taking a step backward. But the answer to your question is yes. Am I more comfortable at Kids Count talking about issues sometimes that definitely 
um, that we would be talking about in this kind of interview than Mariah Peck Short. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with everything you just said because I listened very, very closely last night to what everybody had to say, the governor, you, the speaker, and you're absolutely right. I just heard what you said. You talked about access to all those different things, but I didn't hear one person say we've got a problem with some of these gaps that are developing among our racial groups. And you know who's getting bigger? Our people of color. Mm -hmm. They're going to be the majority here in 10 or 15 years. What kind of state are we building? And I guess I'm surprised that you talk about facts. I don't know how many more facts you can be provided with about these issues. I didn't hear one word. Maybe, maybe I missed it. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear one word. I was surprised by that. And once again, I think I talked about the issues probably more than anyone usually talks about at RIPEC when I talk about daycare. Yeah and I talk about health care, and I talk about education at a RIPEC dinner. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably uh, as um, worldly as folks are going to go. But these are not issue These are difficult issues. Uh, and once again, I do mean that on the facts. And coming today, I, you know, anticipating some of the questions, I was looking um, at the link sheet, the executive order on resident tuition for uh, immigrant students that have um, a completed three years of high school, which is once again not giving anybody anything other than resident tuition. It's not free. And the numbers fascinated me in three years. Um, about almost about 299 students at CCRI. Um, I'd want to verify them so I don't get political fact to um, but, uh, check, but five or six at URI and Rhode Island College. Um, but at the time that Lincoln Chafee issued that executive order, one would have believed that we would have been flooded. Um, the state was just going to be run yeah. over with folks that were going to come to attend college in Rhode Island because we were going to offer resident tuition. And yet, to imagine that 299 students are at CCRI that might not otherwise be there. Uh, is very exciting to me and very important and will actually be discernible in terms of numbers of employment and job training and job growth. We have a minority business enterprises law in the books, but it's rarely enforced. How does the Senate president put teeth into that law or, or advocate that what's on the books addresses the issues that that was meant to address? Minority set-aside issue has been uh, an issue that Senator Metz has worked very hard on, and uh, he's worked hard to on the enforcement piece of it, um, in terms of making sure there was funding for enforcement. Uh, I'm hopeful with uh, a new governor and a recognition of a need for resources at DLT for enforcement in general mm -hmm. that we may see some changes in those areas because there are a number of areas in our labor laws to be honest where with increased enforcement we could do better. Do you think that the economic incentive package that uh, Governor Raimondo championed and much of what she got makes adequate provision for those kinds of companies to take advantage of what's coming down the pike? What I will say is this, I couldn't speak to that question specifically in terms of it will depend on the types of companies that she attracts, but certainly technology, those types of job training uh, programs we have at CCRI, we have folks that would be qualified, so she works towards those. What I would mention to kind of, I think is important, when we did the advice and consent for the members of the I-195 Commission, each and every one of them that came to us, I believe every one of them, if not all, almost all of them, one of the questions we asked was, will you be conscious of the fact that this is all of Providence, that this isn't, that the jobs that you're, that the companies that you're talking to for the I-195 land isn't going to be the Crystal City sitting here with South Providence here and the Jewelry District here, but rather that your view will be an inclusive one with the developers that come into this area and reaching out to that community. As when I went to Baltimore, I saw they had really done a very good job of reaching across the river, so to speak, to ensure that the community was provided employment opportunities when we're incentivizing 
these businesses uh, to come here. So without speaking directly to your question, what I would hope the governor would do, and once again, I, I asked the members of the I-195 Commission, most of them when I was interviewing them, is to ask those kind of questions of future companies that are locating here. We're giving you economic incentives. We anticipate that you're going to ensure diversity, minority hiring, and job training in your plan for Rhode Island. I think that's how you get there. Would you, would you ever consider a Scandinavian model? And that is, uh, no board or commission can be composed of, of people who are all the same race or all the same gender. So something like Slater, you couldn't have you know seven white men sitting. I've never considered actually making that a line. Don't think that's how it should be. <laughs> I think we should have diversity on all of our boards and commissions. Um, I've never considered, but certainly would consider it. I, I wouldn't. I it, need to it, think it's it through. It's not very radical. All of uh, cannot be the same. Yeah, it seems to me that they shouldn't be. I mean, I, it seems I. I I would agree I know, with you. I haven't you. thought about it before, so you want Yeah, to I about. haven't thought about it, but certainly my intuitive reaction is when given the opportunity to appoint members myself or suggestions for members, I have always sought to add diversity to all of our boards and commissions because I think it makes them better. I, I, just I, I know um, I serve on two boards where my race is important. And, you know, we, we live in this ridiculous uh, society in which people claim things are colorblind, uh, but they're not, and your experiences are not. I tell everybody, you are your mother's child, and you bring that to the table. And if you're black, you, your mother is not Greek. And if you're Greek, your mother's not black. So um, I just think it, I, I cannot, it is so important to have different people at the table. I guess why I'm reacting the way to me, it's common sense. <laughs> As you know, you know where I come from, I right? And, and so for me, it just, yes, uh, to me, it's common sense. So that uh, this there last should be else. diversity on every board and commission. This is my last response to you. Um, so uh, I know you to be a good person, and I know, and I think some of it has to do with you being a woman, that your interests are quite different from men in your position. And that's my problem that you will be gone to better things or get tired of doing that, and then some person will come along who doesn't share your outlook. And to that extent, I can see why you would suggest that, and I'd certainly love to look at some of the stuff about the Scandinavian model because it makes a lot of sense is what I'm saying. I, I'm not pushing. I'm I, and, I'm not, and I'm not pushing back. It may, <laughs> it's just something so weird to me because I think that, of course, I guess the answer is of course. <laughs> Maybe that's a better answer. Of course there should be diversity, you know, on every board and commission. We're pushing up to now. Do you have anything left, Kate? We have one final question. I don't know if there was anything in the Racing Rhode Island series that surprised you. Something I, you really didn't know. I think that um, the health issues really were driven home to me in terms of the disparity in the health issues. That's something that I wasn't as keenly aware of. Uh, I was, I think, very much aware of the education, the housing issues because we've dealt with them so much in the General Assembly. Um, however, I would say that when I have focused on health issues in the General Assembly. It's been more on issues from a socioeconomic point of view, oftentimes with a focus on children um, and the right care program, expanding the right care program, ensuring affordability and accessibility for all children. So I had never really um, taken a look at particularly the adult numbers on issues such as um, breast cancer, uh, diabetes was mentioned in one of the articles as well uh, caught me off guard in terms of the statistics being uh, different than what, not different, different, but I just was unaware of them. So I learned something from that. Good, that's what we want. I learned something. And that was, once again, my focus, particularly in the healthcare, had always been more on uh, children's healthcare 
as well as on substance abuse issues and mental health issues. So I think uh, a real pragmatic look or holistic look at all health care issues as they impact the minority community was helpful to me as a policymaker. Well, that's our time. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. We'll do it again, okay? Thanks. Oh, no, I like that. Yeah.